Empire of Ash reveals that sphinxes were the original symbol of the Valyrians before they discovered dragons, back when they were humble shepherds. And we already knew from other quotes that there were about 40 major families of dragon lords that dominated politics in Valyria, and it just vaguely said they had rivalries between different political factions among them. The new thing we learn in Empire of Ash is that there were two big factions of dragon lords in Valyria. The Sphinxes and the Young Dragons. What's the difference between them? We learn in Empire of Ash that the Sphinxes are the descendants of the original Valyrian aristocracy the original nobles and priests when they were humble shepherds, this tiny community of humble shepherds, this tiny little kingdom up in the mountains, who somehow learned to tame dragons with magic and led Valyria during its original wars against the Giscari when they were a young upstart power. So the Sphinxes are the blue-blood nobility the old families, the the upper aristocracy, the old guard families, born to the purple. The young dragons, in contrast, are the younger aristocracy, the lower aristocracy. They descend from common soldiers who became powerful warlords during Valyria's wars of conquest as it expanded outward, Uh, soldiers and generals who grew rich from plunder and slaves as they were conquering the Giscari and then the Roinar and other peoples. So the young dragons are new men, nouveau riche. So these are the two major factions of dragon lords. The older, upper aristocracy are called the Sphinxes because... That was the older symbol of Valyria. As for the other faction, why are they called the Young Dragons? I realized that in my preceding video, specifically on them, I didn't explain their name. Well, I wanted the first video in this series to be shorter as an introduction, and now that we're in the middle of it, I have more time to explain this. It it sort of started out as a derisive nickname which, over the generations, they embraced. That TV tropes would call this an appropriated appellation. That It's like calling them new guy. You know, like Rob Stark is the young wolf. It's the the younger upstart families. They were called, oh, here come those upstart young dragons over there. And over time, they just started calling the younger aristocracy the young dragons. And the name stuck. And so at first, it sounded a little odd on the tongue when I first heard it, but the more I thought on it, the more I realized it made sense in and out of universe. That in universe, it's, well, what else would you call them? The manticores or the griffins? The younger dragons, the young dragon, you know, like Rob is the young wolf. Dayron the first is the young dragon who fought in Dorne. So young dragons in universe, that's why you'd call them that. It, it's... Again, like how in Rome, the populares were the younger faction, and they were called novus homo, Latin for new man, just new guy. It's like calling them new guy. But in, in treatment board, I realized out of universe, um, have you ever heard the political phrase young Turks? Um, it, it's used a lot these days in, in different countries. It originated from... Around World War I, when the old Ottoman Empire was falling apart, the young, vibrant party of Turkish nationals that wanted to make Turkey into a modern state from the ashes of this, they were nicknamed these vibrant, ambitious young Turks, this new cadre who was going to shake everything up. And that term eventually became applied to any new, young, ambitious faction. You know, oh, these guys, the, the... New younger VP executives in the office are a bunch of young Turks. That, that if you've heard that phrase before, so th- what are the young Turks of Valyria? Young dragons. So it's new guy and young Turk kind of rolled into one. And for Valyria, it makes sense. They're called the young dragons. It, it, it sounded weird the moment I heard it, but the more I thought it, and I went, "This is actually pretty fitting." So 
where are the Targaryens in all this? They're a minor member of the Young Dragons faction. They're not just minor for being Young Dragons. That There are relatively strong Young Dragons families. They are one of the weaker ones. That people don't really think of them as a player in this. There are about 40 major Dragon Lord families, and they are one of the Dragon Rider families. They have dragons. They're useful in war. It's not that they're insignificant. It's just relative to everyone else. People don't even think of them as the leaders of the Young Dragons. And because the Young Dragons started out centuries ago as soldiers who got ennobled and got dragons on their own, they're not quite the Valyrian equivalent of the phrase, but the Targaryens in this time period aren't exactly the Valyrian equivalent of the Tyrells and Tullys either. That the phrase were only ennobled 600 years ago from taking up uh, bridge tolls. Whereas the Tyrells and Tullys, you know, they rule entire regions. The Tyrells rule all of the reach. They're powerful, but in terms of prestige, social prestige, they were never kings before the Targaryen conquest, the way the Starks and Lannisters were. The, the Targaryens raised them up as the new leaders of the reach after the conquest. The phrase, in contrast, they're not even, they don't even rule all of the Riverlands. At the start of the series, the Tullys rule the Riverlands. The phrase are vassals who weren't even nobles 600 years ago. It's more like, just in, in terms of feel, and this is more feel than an accuracy, the Targaryens in this time period are sort of like the Mormonts to the Starks, where, like, the phrase are despised as these sleazy upstarts. It, they were never very pow like the Mormons, they were never very powerful and they were never kings or leaders or anything. They're respectable as minor houses go, but they're not really noteworthy. This is just my opinion, though. Just think like in terms of Mormont scale, in terms of the political goings on in the Seven Kingdoms and Valyria. They're not very powerful. And the Mormons were never kings of Bear Island. They're, they're soldiers the Starks gave the lands to after kicking out the Ironborn. That the, of course, the Sphinxes think of young dragons and Targaryens in, in terms of how everyone else would look down on the phrase. But objectively, they're more like, and they would like to think, oh, well, we're more than that. They're, they're like Mormont level. That's just an analogy, though. But where are they physically? They moved to Dragonstone, which is a remote trading outpost fort at the fringe of the Freehold, nowhere near the centers of power. That This is my simplified map of the Valyrian Freehold, stretching across half the known world, most of Essos, from Pentos in the west to Marine in the east. Look really hard at the upper left of this, I don't know if you can see at this resolution, to that tiny red dot in the narrow sea off the coast of Westeros. Zooming in, that's Dragonstone. Now, I think the TV show did a good job of trying to show that, in, in terms of its design, how impressive Dragonstone looks. That people say in the books, even looking at it, it's clearly built with lost architectural techniques that the Valyrians had that we can't recreate, that it's this relic of a more advanced civilization that looks physically sturdier, uh, it it's, looks in their design here angular and menacing, it looks really intricate and advanced in a way other castles in Westeros don't. When they show the interior in Season 7, there's these impressive open spaces carved into the middle of it, carved out of the living rock, just think of how impressive the design of Dragonstone has looked over the years in the live-action TV show. Wow, this is some relic of a, a more advanced civilization. Well, for a sense of scale, Dragonstone wasn't a major part of Valyria. Dragonstone was a small Valyrian border fort, if you were impressed by the size and design of this. That was just a tiny outpost. The Sphinxes, in contrast, ruled Old Valyria itself, their capital city, the City of Wonders. So, by comparison, try to think of, relative to this tiny, what for them was a tiny border fort on Dragonstone, what Valyria itself is like. That 
Star Wars analogy, that if all we had to go on of what is Coruscant like, for many years before the prequels, we never saw Coruscant, compare to the local imperial garrison on Tatooine versus the centers of imperial power on Coruscant itself, the capital planet. You know, Luke says if there's a shining center to the galaxy, Coruscant, Tatooine is the planet farthest from it. But the contrast between we're out in the middle of nowhere and the capital, this is like a Roman border fort on Hadrian's Wall versus Rome itself. Or, you know, Star Wars cribbed a lot from Isaac Asimov's Foundation series that the idea that there's this city planet, Coruscant, is basically Trantor, the imperial capital capital of the entire galaxy in his Foundation series. That in Asimov's Foundation series terms, Dragonstone was Terminus, this minor outpost at the very fringe of the galaxy, compared to Trantor, which is the imperial capital at the center of the empire, at the center of the galaxy. If you're contrasting what we've already seen of Valyria as just Dragonstone, that's nothing compared to Valyria. Valyria was built with and run by magic, this shining highest achievement of human civilization. Vast megastructures dominating the landscape, thousands of people, and above it all, ruled by sorcerer princes on Dragonback, the Dragon Lords, reigning over all they saw. What I'm trying to build up to is it would be wrong to assume that the pre doom Valyrians were exactly like the later Targaryens. By later Targaryens, I don't even mean like Rhaegar, I mean even the Conquest generation, which we have a decent amount of notes on, Aegon I and his two sister wives, that, you know, I'm saying this of myself, even I kind of just assumed Valyria was, oh, that, times ten or times a hundred, just really sit down and think about they wouldn't be exactly like them. They were separated by time, by scale. Two major factors, the first of which I already touched on, is Valyria was vastly more powerful than the tiny remnant of Aegon during the conquest. And second, ultimately more important, is that cultures change over time and are not uniform. And just, I realize, you know, you sit down and think about it, they wouldn't be the same. First off, what is powerful to them? Well, when the Targaryens fled to Dragonstone away from Valyria, they brought five dragons with them, of which four later died, apparently of old age, because they didn't fight each other, but they left eggs behind from which another two hatched. So during the War of Conquest itself, they had three adult dragons, and that was enough to conquer all of Westeros with. Just three adult dragons. Skipping ahead to 130 years later, the most dragons the Targaryens ever had was during the Dance of the Dragons, this big civil war they had, when they had 20 living dragons. However, not all of them were adult war-capable dragons. Three of them were hatchlings. A lot of them weren't a lot of them started out riderless, and then some died and others got new riders, so there weren't 15 on both sides at the same time. I think the most ever committed to one side in battle was six at the Battle of the Gullet, even then, because it wasn't a dragon versus dragon battle, so it was one-sided no matter what you did. During the Dance of the Dragons, the most dragons that ever fought against each other on opposing sides against other dragons... Two different battles, the biggest in the war, involved three dragons. In both cases, it was two ganging up on another one from the other side. That even in the Dance of the Dragons, the biggest dragon versus dragon war in Westeros, there was never a two versus two dragon fight. And they never had more than 20 dragons, and they only ever really had 17 less adults with riders. And not on the same side. No one faction in a war ever had 20 war-capable dragons. 
Valyria, during the conquest of the Roinar, we got some descriptions for that they said in the climactic battle of the Roinar Wars, they deployed 300 dragons in a single battle. They, for a baseline of how many dragons did they have relatively recently, about 600 years before the Doom, they had that many. So this is all relative, I'm just playing with numbers here, ballpark figure generally what is considered a powerful dragon lord like how powerful is a sphinx family relative to a young dragon family well facts we already knew i'm not telling you anything new just inference from what we already saw in the books the targaryens had five dragons at the time of the doom and were officially considered a relatively minor member of the 40 or so dragon lord families that the Targaryen conquest of Westeros, all that, which is so famous in the narrative since the first book, was done with three dragons. At the Doom, the Targaryens had five and were still considered relatively weak. And how many existed at the Doom, it's hard to say that there were at least, when I say there's hundreds of dragons in it, there were at least 300 adult war-capable dragons if their numbers stayed the same since the Roinar Wars. Probably higher because they have so many more resources from expanding into Western Essos and taking the Roinar lands and building the free cities. I did the math that if the Targaryens started with three dragons during the conquest and ended up with 20 in 120 years, the limiting factor isn't how fast dragons can breed. In five to 600 years, there could be over a thousand. The limiting factor is really, do you have enough resources to feed these things? It's not a matter of how fast they're breeding, so probably more than 300 adults, but I'm using the conservative estimate that, okay, during the Roinar War, this is how many they were able to field in one big battle, in, in the biggest battle of the war. So let's go with 300 as an established figure. 40 Dragonlord families, and let's say the bare minimum each of them has on average is five because the Targaryens are a minor one and that's how many they have well four times five is 200 so if each of these 40 families has five let's see how that plays out that let's say if there's 30 young dragon families who each have I'm making up numbers just for example who each have five that would come to 150 and maybe the five strongest young dragon families have ten instead of five, which would be another fifty added in there, five times ten. So combined, playing around with the numbers, that's two hundred-ish on the young dragon side. Maybe there are only five Sphinx families. It's not that there we, there might not be an even split between of the forty, like twenty and twenty. I think it's more probable that there's a smaller number of Sphinx families but that individually they have more dragons. Like, if these numbers play out, what if there's, like, only five Sphinx families, but each one controls over 20 dragons individually? Like, war-capable dragons that, on their own, one Sphinx family could just, in the numbers of five is considered weak, and there were at least 300 of them, and there's 40 dragon lords. One Sphinx family I can see fielding more adult dragons than were physically alive during the Dance of the Dragons on both sides. These are the powers and numbers we're dealing with here in Valyria and its prime. So I, I asked my source about this. If the, you see, you have the script Bible there of how season one is going to play out across ten episodes, or how you want it to play out. Would there be that many really huge dragon battles? And they smiled at me and just. Really seems they will. I don't know how many... Will we literally see hundreds of dragons fighting on screen at the same time? I doubt it. But, you know, in season one of Game of Thrones, there were, in the story, thousands of Stark and Lannister cavalry fighting and killing each other in Whispering Wood at River Run. But we didn't see any of it on screen because budget. But they physically exist. That This is a world where you can have cavalry in the thousands. This is a world in which, in Valyria in its prime, there are at least 300 living adult war-capable dragons. And even if we only ever saw, like, a three-versus-three fight, that would be bigger than anything ever in Westeros' history. 
the, the bigger than anything in the Dance of the Dragons. Just three versus three, or even two versus two, frankly. They, they just said they have a lot of stuff planned. and But it's actually easier to work with completely CGI dragons than it is with direwolves, because those are live animals they scale up, which is why they're so difficult to play with. But the CGI dragons, they do what you tell them to do, and they don't take a day off. So we'll see what happens. But remember, HBO itself has said, we are confident enough in this as a franchise that whatever prequel we pick, we'll hit the ground running with in terms of budget. It won't be like Game of Thrones Season 1, where they had to have a tiny budget until they proved themselves. HBO has publicly said, we're going to give the prequels, any prequel we make, we will give its first season a budget as big as the later seasons of Game of Thrones. So, I asked something like, compared to that, because you've seen the script Bible, my source, is this like maybe in season four or five-ish of Empire of Ash, we'll start seeing two versus two dragon fights, and this is all backstory? Like Game of Thrones season one, they said, no, there's battles by the end of season one involving a lot of dragons. So, I wasn't told anything firm or definitive. It just nods and smiles of, I think they know what they're doing with this. And I, I reason to be excited, though I heard nothing specific. So make of that what you will. And this is all on paper, of course. Who knows what they'll actually make when they see numbers and budget. This is just the script. It, it's scripted as having that many dragons. And in how many times in Game of Thrones, the TV show script out huge battles in early seasons they had to abandon for budget purposes. So, time will tell, and you guys know as much as I do. First big point was just the scale of this is so much bigger. And second, and really the core of this video, cultures change over time and are not uniform. Point I want to emphasize, screen cap this and comment on it, comment about this in, in the comment section, the Sphinxes and Young Dragons are not just direct copies of the Targaryens, as we knew them from A Song of Ice and Fire. Even just, well, they're like the Targaryens, but on a bigger scale with more dragons. That would be boring. They're really almost two distinct subcultures, new sub-factions that the prequel will explore. I'm thinking in terms of, you know, like when you're making a, a modded video game for like the Total War series or for Dungeons and Dragons or something that if this was a video game in terms of faction rules and bonuses and negatives, they're not the same as the Targaryens, that they have a different profile and stats. Because if you think about it, a major complaint about the potential Long Night prequel is that it has the exact same villains. They're literally deathless. And not just the same immortal vampires or elves, like if this was Lord of the Rings or Silmarillion, where sometimes elves live for thousands of years. Not just, oh, it's the same vampire character. The same non-speaking zombies. They don't talk. They have no culture, no, no world-building, and ultimately no characterization. And that's the zombies. Even the White Walkers are just living weapons made from humans that don't talk. I mean, there's quotes from Martin where he's coyly said, when people go, are we going to delve into the culture of the White Walkers in later books? And he just has gone, do they really have a culture as we would know it? And we found out from the TV show that they're not a race, they're magical weapons made from humans, that they probably don't have really a culture, they're robots, animated by magics, they're constructs, so how much personality they have, it's literally the same villains. What, what more is this going to add? So, it would be boring to have just the same thing over and over again, that I'm really liking this, that no, it's this interesting twist on their, neither of them is exactly like the Targaryens as we knew them, even by the Conquest. Rest of this video is going to be talking about this point of the differences between them, that, as I said, the Sphinxes are the original Valyrian aristocracy, the original, they descend from the original nobles and priests when they were humble shepherds, who somehow learned to tame dragons. The young dragons 
warlords who rose during the outer waves of conquest from plunder new men. Because they're the heirs of the original Valyrian aristocracy thousands of years ago, the Sphinxes are closer to what those proto-Valyrians were like. The I'm saying that in, in the sense of proto-Indo-Europeans, really ancient people that originated everything, that the original Valyrians, the proto-Valyrians who discovered dragons and conquered the old Giscari Empire, the originals. The Sphinxes are closer to what the Proto-Valyrians like than the Targaryens that we know now in the modern age. So the Sphinxes are half what we're familiar with as Targaryen or Valyrian, and half something else. Basically, they're the Targaryens of the Targaryens, this ancient and mysterious culture in the Targaryens' case, relative to the rest of Westeros, that this is another step back from the Targaryens, it's the Sphinxes. So, what I already said in the leak that already came out is that the Sphinxes are the conservative faction of Dragon Lords, which is logical. They're the upper aristocracy. When did you ever hear of the old upper aristocracy being the non-conservative ones? They descend from the original rulers, logically the conservative. They are conservative to Valyrian values, not Westerosi ones. And this is where it got clever and played around with, well, what do we mean by conservative? Rest of this video, I'm going to talk about how this affects their views on incest, their views on religion, both across space and time, and briefly on blood magic and homosexuality, LGBT issues. The overwhelming majority of this is on religion. The other parts are just quick notes, because there's a lot of detail on how that affects their whole culture. First off, the Dragon Lords have a tradition of incest marriages, brother to sister, to keep the bloodline pure, as they say. The Sphinxes take incest very seriously, uh, obsessed with blood purity, which, again, makes sense and isn't really expanding how much more. If I said, well, they're the conservative Valyrians, you would assume that they must take incest seriously. That, yes. And this makes sense also within the story. They're the old bloodlines of Valyria's original aristocracy. Logically, they'd be the ones most obsessed with their lineage and blood purity. In contrast, I, I, I talk about this more in the other video, the young dragons are not as obsessed with incest marriages and blood purity. They spend more time out in the conquered provinces, so logically, a few of them even marry non-Valyrians from the local elites. This is rarer, but it's been known to happen. That It's been described their POV character is a biracial, half-black female dragon rider. I talk about that more in the other video. I want to emphasize, this is on a spectrum. It's rare, but not unheard of, for the young dragons to marry non-Valyrians. Incest is still common among them. Don't think they're the not-incest faction, they're just not as obsessed with it. And, wait, the Targaryens are in the faction that doesn't strictly follow incest? Well, actually, if you think about it, it's kind of logical from what we already knew about them from the books. We already knew they were a minor family, not one of the powerful ancient families. So why would they have a strong reason to be obsessed with their pure lineage? Once we find out, well, there's actually a spectrum of Valyrians. Most of them take incest seriously. Some don't quite as much because they're the younger families. Well, we already knew they were a younger family. Uh, I talk about the specifics of that in the other video. Please check it out. Next, and this is the bulk of what I want to talk about, the Sphinxes are the conservative faction, so they take the Valyrian religion very seriously. Just generically, that's all I'm going to say. They take it pretty seriously, to the point that they embrace a lot of archaic aspects of it. So I'm not giving out more spoilers than that, I'm just saying, relative to what we already knew from the novels, we can infer some things about that. If you haven't read the books, I'll guide you through this. Because... That raises a whole ton of issues because religion as a concept was very different in Valyria compared to Westeros. I don't just mean their specific religion, I mean their attitude towards all religions. 
we already know from the books that Valyria is also a lot like Rome regarding religion. That so long as conquered peoples paid their taxes, they didn't really care what religions they followed. They didn't actively try to enforce the original Valyrian religion on other people. They tolerated a wide array of different religions and cults within their domains. These are quotes from the World Book. At the height of her power, the Freehold was home to a hundred temples. Some had tens of thousands of worshippers, some precious few. But no faith was forbidden in Valyria, nor were any exalted above the others. Many Valyrians worshipped more than one god, turning to different deities according to their needs. More, it is said, worshipped none at all. Most regarded freedom of faith as a hallmark of any truly advanced civilization. Dozens of sects flourished in Valyria, sometimes quarreling violently with one another. Some scholars have suggested that the dragon lords regarded all faiths as equally false, believing themselves to be more powerful than any god or goddess. They looked upon priests and temples as relics of a more primitive time, though useful for placating slaves, savages, and the poor, with promises of a better life to come. Moreover, a multiplicity of gods helped to keep their subjects divided and lessened the chances of their uniting under the banner of a single faith to overthrow their overlords. Religious tolerance was to them a means of keeping the peace in their lands. That, in comparison to the Seven Kingdoms where they're always contending with the faith of the Seven and the church hierarchy there in the High Septon, they never really did that in Valyria, that they were so religiously tolerant it kept everyone divided. There was never a counterpart religious authority to threaten the secular authority of the dragon lords who saw many saw themselves as above any gods, as we are the rulers, we don't need one all-powerful re religious church here. Let the people worship what they will, it's none of our business. So religion was pretty much tolerated and very diverse to them, that they never tried to impose it on other people. Much like the Romans, that it's, well, why would I want to share my gods? It's just, it's a different attitude towards it entirely. On a spectrum, that the sphinxes are most likely to follow the original Valyrian religion very seriously, with archaicisms, but it's private. And many of the young dragons don't take it very seriously, in contrast. It, they, they go through the motions, most of them aren't very religious, a lot of them are atheists, and quite a few young dragons actually follow new religions and cults. Some adopted from conquered people, some of them got uh, popped up over time from various prophets. And this is on a spectrum. The, the more moderate young dragons, most of the young dragons usually have incest marriages, do casually follow the original Valyrian religion. They're just not as strict about it as the Sphinxes. For them, it's serious business. Just to emphasize this, the fundamental difference between them is that the Sphinxes are upper aristocracy and the young dragons are lower aristocracy. Obviously, the Sphinxes think the young dragons are upstarts and that some of them don't even act like real Valyrians. But that's just their disparaging opinion of them. It's not something they would politically fight over. They're not inherently fighting due to religion. The difference between them is purely that the Sphinxes have power and the young dragons want power. They're both aristocrats. They both practice slavery. It's just, there's the party, in, they're politicians. There's a party in power and a party out of power that wants to get it. That's really the only major reason they're fighting each other. I, I talk of spectrums, that a lot of the young dragons are more moderate, that they would go through the motions of the religion, would actually think, you know, we should take our religion seriously. The sphinxes, on the whole, wouldn't really overtly yell about this, that only the most fringe, fanatical, hard-right sphinxes 
would be someone saying, oh, the young dragons have forgotten the gods. Oh, we need to fight them. We can't let them share power. That This isn't part of their official platform, apart from one or two hotheads who might be really driven by that. That's exceptional. So religion in Valyria was analogous to religion in ancient Rome, and Empire of Ash builds off that established idea. Now, HBO's Rome series put out a great 10-minute video explaining Roman religion, particularly if you've seen HBO's Rome. They use examples from that uh, from 10 years ago. So watch it at the link below. It's a legal link. It was posted on HBO's YouTube channel. Uh, for copyright reasons, I'm not going to splice it into this video. I'm just It's online, legal. Please watch it. It's very informative and with all the experts they hired explaining how everything works in Rome. And watch that and go, Valyria is like this. Not just one religion, but their attitude towards all religions, that they overlap, that we can borrow things and all the gods might be real and well. If my wife is pregnant, I'll worship that fertility god from another religion now. If I'm going to war, I might pick up that war god from another religion and not see them as contradictory. On top of that, well, they make points in that, and I'll refer to it quickly, but Roman religion wasn't static. It changed over time, overlapping between eras. And, you know, the classic thing you heard in high school of, oh, they worship 12 Olympian gods like the Greeks and just call them different names, so Zeus is Jupiter to them and so forth. That is an oversimplified stereotype. And really a snapshot of the middle phase of their development. The early Romans were influenced by the Etruscans, while the later Romans of many centuries later, a thousand years later, were influenced by religions of conquered peoples and new cults that popped up. This is an Etruscan statue, and just notice this looks different from what we would see in Rome, that the Etruscans, their origin is a mystery, but they came from Asia Minor and Turkey. They, they weren't native to Italy. Some people think they were, but it's this historical mystery of who were they. They weren't Indo-European. And the differences of how this influenced early Rome, you can tell something weird and mysterious was influencing them that wasn't Greek. At right, you have the statue I showed of the Roman sky god Jupiter. Bearded man, holding a thunderbolt, attended by eagles, right? That's what we all think of as Jupiter. At left, you have a statue of the Etruscan sky god Tinea, also a bearded man holding a thunderbolt, etc. They, they basically seem analogous of, oh, the Etruscan, that's their version of Zeus and Jupiter, Tinea. Same thing, it's just a different name. Then you get to other Etruscan things, like this is the Etruscan sun goddess, Katha. She has no direct equivalent among later Greco-Roman gods. It wasn't the same exact religion. There were some points of overlap. So how did this influence the Romans? Well, unlike the Greeks, many Romans practiced divination from signs, a big part of their culture. And this is distinctly an Etruscan practice, not Greek. The Greeks didn't do this to this extent. It was an archaic Etruscan practice surviving into later periods. Uh, when I say divination, I mean things such as augury from birds. That was a major one. That I saw three doves in the sky over the temple today. The time is right to go to war. That was a major one. Also, hepatoscopy, which is reading livers and intestines of slaughtered animals. That This is, I grabbed this from Wikipedia, this is a chart for reading the marks on an animal's liver to see which parts say which signs. If you saw HBO's Rome, that, that was actually in that, that. There's that whole scene where Caesar has to go to the priests to bribe them, <laughs> cynically bribe them to say, oh... We saw some eagles today. It's time to go to war. That, that's in, that Whenever someone says, oh, I saw the signs, I saw an eagle, that's an Etruscan, not a Greek thing. It's this archaic survival. But the very first episode of HBO's Rome also, if you remember, had a religious ritual in which a tia is drenched in the blood of a freshly slaughtered bull as a baptism of rebirth. 
This is not classical Roman, nor is it an Etruscan archaicism. It's called a Torobolium from the cult of Sibyl, which we know originated in Anatolia, modern Turkey, that this isn't something the Etruscans did. That we, we can date where it started somewhere else. The cult of Sibyl, the Great Mother. And here we have Mithraism, uh, artwork from his temples. That This is one of the new mystery cults that sprang up in later Rome, from the 1st to 3rd centuries AD, along with some other ones like the Isis cult. They were popular with Roman soldiers, it makes sense that they were spread moving around between the frontiers, that soldiers would pick them up pretty easily. And, because it's a mystery religion, we don't know everything about it, but it features a heroic warrior, Mithras, slaughtering a sacrificial bull inside a cavern, that you always see this in the artwork on their temples, and then holding a banquet with the sun god from the slaughtered bull, and it involved having banquets in these underground temples. Mithraism was his popular cult in the late Roman Empire. So when you look at religion in Rome, it wasn't one static template. It's there were Etruscan survivals. Other things, and don't assume everything was an Etruscan survival, because some things were stuff they absorbed from conquered peoples, and other ones were just cults that sprang up internally. Well, was that from conquered people, or did we just come up with Mithras on our own? Some people think it was Iranian. It's, it's hard to say, but... In Empire of Ash, by analogy, the Sphinxes are not the analog of the Etruscans for Valyria. That's not what I'm building up to. The Etruscans in this scenario are the original ancient Valyrians, who tamed dragons 5,000 years ago. That, that's the proto-Valyrians. They're as far removed from them as we are from the ancient Egyptians who built the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's that much time has passed, and they still say, we are the original Valyrians, and well, you're their descendants, but it's not the same thing. Key point here is that the Sphinxes, in the years right before the Doom, in that time frame, are analogous not to the Etruscans, but to the older Roman patrician families in the first century BC, the older holdout families you would see in HBO's Rome, who practice several archaic Etruscan holdovers. Like if this was Rome, these would be people who are really obsessed with augury and divination, whereas the younger aristocrats would be going, oh, these old stuffy old senators that stuck in the past. So they've been around for 5,000 years, growing and changing. So they follow what they think the religion is very seriously with all of these archaic holdovers mixed with a few things from conquered peoples or that got distorted over 5,000 years. Like with Rome, the Sibyl bull sacrifice, that's not Greek. That's not Etruscan. That was absorbed from conquest. The young dragons, in contrast, are a lot like a late Roman soldier who spent a lot of time on the frontiers in Britannia, not even in Italy, and followed the Mithras cult with, with the bull sacrifice in the cave thing, but, if you asked, would still consider himself Roman. That it's, what does it mean to be Roman? What does it mean to be Valyrian? They said these are major questions of the series, is the question of cultural identity. Drawing from the real-life parallel of, okay, your archaic uh, Roman patricians in Rome itself following some Etruscan holdovers, you're so uh, conservative and old-school, versus Roman soldier following a new cult who isn't a nobleman in Britannia. In, in the terms of the young dragons, I, I asked, and they just said, you'll see. I said, oh, you mean like cults we knew were in Valyria at this time, like the Black Goat of Cohor and the Bearded Priests of Norvos and the Pale Child Bacalon, that they know of these cults and they did their homework and we shall see which ones made the cut and which didn't. I think a lot of these would at least get name-dropped, but which ones will play a significant role, which ones major characters might follow, like 
does the POV character for the Young Dragons follow a different religion entirely? That'd be interesting. Uh, these other cults have popped up. And in terms of developing them, it's just there's whole sections of the series Bible, I hope you all see it someday, that they said they hired religious scholar Reza Aslan to sit down and think up on an academic level what are these cults like? What is the main Valyrian religion like? And work out how century by century the Valyrian religion changed, which parts the, the Sphinxes do that are actually archaicisms, which parts got absorbed, why the young dragons do different things. This is a major part of the show, is world building and what is culture, but heavily influenced by religion. So a lot of thought and world building went into this. And for people who still say, I'm making all of this up, it's pure fan fiction. When I posted the original leak about Empire of Ash, Reza Aslan retweeted it. And I replied, sir, is this confirmation that I didn't make this up? And of course, he wisely didn't reply. But that's the most proof I can point to of, I didn't make this up. And the report about this in Business Insider nicely also posted it. And I said, oh, guys, Reza Aslan uh, retweeted my thing, put it in the report, and they did. So check that out. Last big point I want to make about religion and everything is just layers, is what I'm trying to say. Layers. Um, example. Star Wars prequel trilogy began with older, stylized chip designs, but planned it out so that by the last one, by episode three, we start seeing intermediate stages, a, a hybrid of the first and last chip designs. And if in the original trilogy we saw TIE fighters, and in Phantom Menace episode one we saw stylized ships that didn't really look like that, more than a little, like the cockpit a little, I guess, but then by episode three, Revenge of the Sith, you see something that looks kind of like a hybrid between the two. They're moving towards the original trilogy, right? If you didn't see that intermediate stage, but were shown the first and last stages, you could come up with some reasonably functional guesses that the missing link looked like a hybrid between the two. It's much more difficult if you only have the intermediate and final stages and don't know what the beginning stage looked like. Just parse out as best you can what the original may have looked like. If you just have a TIE fighter and then the Jedi fighter from Episode 3, you can... Okay, th these are the parts that are clearly TIE fighter-like. And wait, what's that other... The silhouette is different. It, it has an astromech in it. Other aspects of it. It's really hard to work backwards like that. It's easier to fill in gaps. But you have to watch out that history, like ship development, isn't always a straight line. For example, Darth Vader's TIE X-1 prototype, the one he used around the Death Star, was a transitional stage prototype between TIE Fighter and the later TIE Interceptor. That's true, but the X-1 had shields and a hyperdrive, the other two do not. The just cost-effectiveness for mass production, that was a blind alley of development. That, imagine, if archaeologists in the far tens of thousands of years future only had surviving examples of the TIE Interceptor and the X-1, purely working backwards, they might assume the TIE Fighter had shields and a hyperdrive. The, oh, design evolved away from having shields and a hyperdrive, when it actually doesn't. That This was a blind alley of development that, to increase, I think, the surface area of the, of the solar panels, they made them, on, on the X-1, they made them curved inward, but they didn't come to dagger points. And then by the interceptor, they come to dagger points, and it's faster, but they said, you know, for mass production, it's not economical to give it shields and a hyperdrive. So... How would you work backwards from this? That sometimes there's dead ends, and you're working off of misinformation. Similarly, the Etruscans remain a historical mystery. What little we know about their origins, history, politics, language, religion, 
is just what scraps of info we have from early Roman sources, and analyzing early Romans to try to parse out what's an Etruscan holdover. Now, the Sphinxes are the closest surviving thing to the Proto-Valyrians, and really the only clues anyone has about what they were like. But still, they're clues, not certain facts, just bits and pieces to go on. At least some of it is actually true, don't dismiss them, but also at least some of it got distorted. By comparison, for what you're probably more familiar with, how much are the Starks, like their ancestors, the First Men? That's a big question we've been debating. I mean, they're similar, that there's clear signs that one evolved from the other, but there are also archaic differences. And it's implied that the wildlings are a bit closer to what their common ancestors were like, that they all descend from the First Men, that the wildlings are a bit closer to what the original First Men were like, and the Starks and other Northmen, they've been in contact with the Andals for so long south of the Wall, they act a bit more like them. Um, and there's other descendants of the First Men that are kind of similar, like the Hill Tribes of the Vale, um, the Ironborn are a big one, uh, the Cranog men, and there's variations on it, so you're never entirely sure. A uh, basic one is that the Ironborn, the Wildlings, and the Hill Tribes all have elected kingships, or kings who only rule through popular support, non-hereditary kingships, that the Wildlings have the king beyond the wall, the Ironborn have the king's mood election, the hill tribes, anyone can speak in a council meeting. It's implied that the first men weren't absolute monarchs like that, and it changed that they were a little more like the Ironborn or the Wildlings. But you have to play around with it. And other things are harder to tell, like, did the original first men have female warriors? Well, the Wildlings do, and the hill tribes do, but the Starks don't, and the Ironborn don't normally. So, how much can you read from that of what the First Men were like? And beyond that, that's just going back to the Long Night. Even before that, 8,000 years ago, how much are the Starks even like the original First Men when they crossed the Arm of Dorne 12,000 years ago and, and fought the children in wars for centuries? It said, when the wars ended, they adopted worship of the old gods from the children. So, wait, that wasn't their original religion. So the first first men, the ones who fought the children before the wars ended, therefore originally had some other religion. And they mention this in the books very sporadically, that it's implied that it, their original religion, whatever it was, focused on one god of the sky and wind and one of the sea, that there was... Uh, the, the Ironborn have the drowned god of the sea and the storm god of the air, that they also mentioned the, the legends of the stormlands and how Storm's End got built, that um, the during God's grief took to wife the daughter of the sky god and the sea goddess, and there's also legends of this and the three sisters. It pops up enough that when you look at it like in a wiki article in a list on the first men, that, you know, I think that's what their original religion was like. It had a, a duality of Sky God and, and Storm and Sea God was probably what the originals were like. We guess. You see, working backwards. And one of the great things about George R. R. Martin's writing is that he did this on purpose. You know, unreliable narrator. In universe, legends are realistically myth. Different legends are contradictory, some are clearly pure fiction and some got distorted over time, but have a kernel of truth to them. But exactly how much is true or not, that's the hard part. It's not just a simple binary of it's true or it's not. Well, obviously the White Walkers are real, but how much is true? Legend says the wall was built to keep out the White Walkers. That part's true enough. And Old Nan also tells nursery stories that the White Walkers captured human women to sire horrible half-human children with them. That's probably just distorted myth. Old Nan also says they rode giant spiders made of living ice. 
Is that true or not? We don't know. It's not this simple either-or, that there's some in the middle which it divides fandom to this day. It's why we're still debating it, despite not having a new book in seven years. Of how much is this real or not? Some legends, by degrees, sound more plausible to different people. My point being that plot mysteries like this, with a lot of half-explained details, reward audience engagement and repeat viewing, and ultimately ensure longevity of a series that it's been three years since even World of Ice and Fire came out, we're still debating things from it. That It reminds me so much of that, that speech they give in Episode 2 of Westworld, where he's saying, you know, they have fully realistic humanoid robots, you shoot them, it looks like a real person bleeding, but it, that gets boring. You, you shoot one robot, cowboy, you've shot them all. People come for the story depth. And it's this whole speech Ford gives that titillation, horror, elation, they're parlor tricks. People don't return for the obvious things we do, the garish things. They come back because of the subtleties, the details. They come back because they discover something they imagine no one had ever noticed before. Just the whole online community of YouTube forums of people picking apart the details and going, you know, I think the original religion of the first men was actually Storm and Sky God, or this is what this real legend of Azor Ahai was like. It rewards repeat engagement versus, well, what was the White Hunt in Season 7? It just a repeat, larger scale of hard home, of other battles they had. How many times can you have no dialogue, Kit Harrington slashing at a zombie with a sword before it gets repetitive. That this is spectacle. This isn't rewarding repeat viewing with layers of detail and depth that reward rewatch, of going over the plot mysteries upon rewatch. So it has very little return value. So a complaint about the Long Night prequel pitch, beyond being a rehash, is that because it outright would show things meant to be distant legend, it loses that mystery element. If we actually see them making White Walkers, what is there to parse out? So, here's my chart for comparison, that we have the Starks in the present, and we want to know about the First Men, who I've, I've italicized, we don't know about them very well. What did the First Men do during the Long Night? What were they like as a culture? that they turned into more like the Wildlings as an intermediate stage, and then into the Starks. So by comparing the Starks to the Wildlings, you can try to pick out, well, this is something different the Wildlings do. Why is that? Why do they burn their dead instead of burying them? Because they're afraid of the White Walkers reanimating them, to parse out what the First Men were. But by direct analogy, as we've been sitting around doing that, if we want to know how did the Proto-Valyrians tame dragons and build Valyria, and what does this have to do with the Doom? In italics, because we don't really know them very well, but it's not just, yup, we're showing you how Valyria was made. No, that was 5,000 years ago. We're showing the stories 400 years ago, right before the Doom, but there's still a mystery element in that, that comparably, we have the Targaryens, and we want to know about the Proto-Valyrians, the Sphinxes are a step closer to that, this intermediate stage, and we're analyzing them to try to see what the mysterious people even before them were like. Purely hypothetical example, this isn't something I was told or saw in the series Bible, I am making this up, please don't get confused. What if the Valyrian god Valyrian is currently, that is, modern times and by the young dragons, depicted as a sphinx in that it has a lion with eagle wings and a human face. But then later in, like, season one, we'll see the sphinx's archaic, earlier artistic depictions of Beleriand, which show him with a lion's face. That, is this a hint? That, wait a minute, the earlier version was a lion with wings, and then at a certain point in our development, it, it turned into a lion with wings and a human face. What does that reflect about the Proto-Valyrians? Or did they use an entirely different third version? Hard to say. 
perhaps they used a more or less realistic looking hybrid animal like four legs and no wings you know six limbs isn't something the dragons can do but like a four-legged animal with an eagle's head that you know this looks like a realistic splice using blood magic of a lion and an eagle and then through cultural osmosis and distortion that the sphinx's version came to look more artistic it doesn't look like something it could be a real animal and six limbs and then wait a minute did something happen in your development where you started depicting human animal crosses and what does that mean but i'm making this up as an example it's equally possible they could have like the modern sphinx with a human face the sphinx one with an animal face and the proto valyrians used some sort of demon figure that looks even less humanoid i'm not sure another hypothetical example again not related to anything i was told just the difficulty of parsing out what came from what. Let's say that just prior to the Doom, the Valyrian god Valyrian is depicted as a sphinx of some kind, doesn't matter if human face or not, and this probably originated with the Proto-Valyrians, possibly with some variation, but okay, it's a sphinx of some kind, Valyrian. Oh, you already knew the god names from the dragons were named after them. Balerion, Meraxes, Vagar. But what if we're also shown that the Valyrian god Meraxes is depicted in Empire of Ash as a harpy and is commonly referred to as Misa Meraxes? Well, and hypothetical, they didn't tell me this, just, well... We can say that's probably, with some degree of certainty, a cultural feature they absorbed from when they conquered the old Giscari Empire. That, yeah, I'm pretty sure this, is, this isn't us, this is them. I'd also note, A Song of Ice and Fire harpies have bat wings. I took this from a heraldry thing on the Wiki of Ice and Fire. The TV show forgot that, so if you see them, they use eagle wings, which makes it confusing with sphinxes, so they have to work that out, but... So, Valyrian looks like a sphinx, that's probably Valyrian. Uh, Meraxes, called Misa Meraxes, which is blatantly a Giscari word, and it looks like a harpy, that's probably something that got changed when they absorbed the Giscari. But, what if the sphinx's older, archaic, mysterious depiction of the Valyrian god Vagar looks like a griffin, yet the modern version looks like a dragon? Is that an ancient version originating from the Proto-Valyrians? Or is that something that got absorbed from other conquered peoples? So you see, it, just like the, the bull thing uh, with Atia in Rome, where that isn't Etruscan, that's something from the East that got mixed in there. So it's not a simple binary of everything the Sphinxes do must be something the Proto-Valyrians did. Not everything the older patricians in Rome did came from the Etruscans. There is no clear answer. And we are going to have fun picking this apart. And, and it said in the books, a sphinx is a bit of this, a bit of that. A human face, the body of a lion, the wings of a hawk. The sphinx is the riddle, not the riddler. It's in their name. The sphinx's faction are a bit of this and a bit of that. A patchwork of customs absorbed from different peoples over 5,000 years, some of which is Proto-Valyrian and the only existing hints about what the Proto-Valyrians were like, but some of which is not. Their very identity is the riddle, to parse out which aspects came from which origins, to parse out what they were like originally before this fusion. For example, here we have classical artwork example of an Etruscan chimera, cast bronze statue, that they use the word sphinx the way we would the term genetic chimera. And I was told this, yes, it is supposed to be hypocritical, that if you think about it, this isn't a spoiler, you think about it, the Sphinxes are obsessed with defending Valyria's cultural purity. And they're really a mishmash of the original Valyrians distorted with practices of conquered peoples, like Middle Stage Rome was. 
the Sphinxes. Their very name indicates and reflects a combination of things. That's the joke. It's like a minotaur yelling, I'm a half-man, half-bull fusion. Bow before my purity. As the A Song of Ice and Fire books and Game of Thrones TV series near their climax, theories about the White Walkers and Long Night fuel much of online discussion, theorization, and analysis channels on here. Mark my words, in a few years, we're all going to be talking about what were the ancient original Valyrians like? That their origin must be tied to the doom of what is the source of Valyrian magic if it led to their downfall. How did they tame dragons? How did they build Valyria? And we're going to be looking at the Sphinxes to try to parse out this mystery. And it's going to fuel discussion for years. So if anyone in Valyria is using magic, casting spells, shooting fireballs, wielding magical weapons, it's these guys. There are a couple of kinds of magic in their world, but the darkest and most powerful is blood magic. It's been said that the sorcerer princes of Valyria were very skilled at it. They were infamous for it. And in the first book, Daenerys hatched her dragons using specifically blood magic. You know, she doesn't know all of it, but by feel, she understood that Great power requires great sacrifice. It's not just saying some magic words and poof. It's only life can pay for life. That She hatched the eggs on Drogo's funeral pyre by sacrificing, uh, burning alive the witch, Miri Mazdur. It's in their motto of the Targaryens. It's hidden there the whole time in plain sight that it's fueled by fire and blood. And it's greatly feared for its power, blood magic, and it's widely rumored in the books that the Valyrians conducted unnatural, unholy experiments with magic to try to create monsters out of animal hybrids to make new creatures. Quote from the World Book, In Septon Barth's Dragons, Worms, and Wyverns, he speculated that the blood mages of Valyria used wyvern stock to create dragons, though the blood mages were alleged to have experimented mightily with their unnatural arts. This claim is considered far-fetched by most maesters, among them Maester Vanyans against the unnatural, which contains certain proofs of dragons having existed in Westeros even in the earliest of days, before Valyria rose to be a power. The theory is that the Valyrians combined wyverns and fireworms and a couple of other animals to create dragons. That fireworms are this kind of subterranean dragon like animal that burrows. They can breathe fire, but it can't fly. And wyverns are a little like dragons, and they have wings, but they can't breathe fire. So some people have speculated maybe they combined them. I really don't think so because. There's so much other evidence that goes over in the world book of, you know, we found fossilized dragon bones that date before Valyria everywhere, from Ib in the north to Sartorios in the south, from Westeros itself to Ashai in the east. There's remains of dragons all over the place, and legends, reliable legends of dragons being active in other parts of the world before the Valyrians. Uh, particularly a shy, they claim dragons came from the Shadowlands first, so it, it seems dragons predate the Valyrians. I personally don't think they created them, that's a whole other issue, but even if they didn't, that it's believable enough to people in-universe that they might have. The, the whole, it is known that the blood mages experimented mightily with their unnatural arts, that they might not have combined the dragons, but they were experimenting with combining different kinds of animal stocks to create animal hybrids. It is believable to them. It, it, they've heard reliable rumors about that. And it is even rumored in the books that the sorcerer princes of Valyria used blood magic 
to experiment with the creation of horrific animal-human hybrids. The Sorcerer Princes being the Sphinxes. There's this whole other section in the books, in the world book, about Gagosos, which was this hellhole penal colony that Valyria sent its absolute worst criminals to to die, and because they were condemned to be worked to death, blood mages were allowed to experiment on them there. Here it is zoomed in on the map. That Quote, world book, The dragon lords sent their worst criminals to Gagosos to live out their lives in hard labor, being worked to death. In the dungeons of Gagosos, torturers devised new torments. And in the flesh pits... Blood sorcery of the darkest sort was practiced, as beasts were mated to slave women to bring forth twisted half-human children. Now, the world book does include sometimes rumors that aren't necessarily true, but this isn't phrased as a uh, rumor reaches us of this. It, it, that happens with other things, as sometimes he reports things that aren't true. Usually this, however, is an author who disdains magic, who doesn't believe the White Walkers were real, doesn't believe a lot of stuff the Valyrians did, and presents almost as fact that they were using blood sorcery to try to make half-human children at Gagosos. Is that true? This is normally a skeptical author. So does this mean that in Empire of Ash, we'll see the Sphinxes as one of their faction bonuses fielding armies of abhuman beastmen as shock troops on the battlefield. After all, they get a plus-one combat roll due to their feral rage. Well, guys, pains me to say it, but probably not. Think about it. Just ask, ask yourself. If the Valyrians ever fielded large armies of half-human beastmen... We'd have heard of it. That if if they use if this is a common unit in warfare for them, like in the Roinar Wars, the Dornish would remember that. It wouldn't be treated as half legend. I mean, instead, it's just treated as rumor, at best, that a few of the Valyrian blood mages were secretly experimenting with hybridization. You know, experimenting, that doesn't even mean they met with much functional success. I, really, the exception, like their version of Kyburn, the, the Frankenstein scientist, you know, making the undead Gregor Clegane, that their version of that was experimenting with, okay, we're hybridizing animals, maybe we can hybridize humans. So I wouldn't think this is, you know, as a faction thing, if this was an RPG or, or, a total war bot or something of, ah, they've got, here's a unit, a squad of beastmen, that they don't have that. We'd have heard of that if it was common. And might we see one or two rare monsters of this? And how common is Gregor? He, he's very atypical in A Song of Ice and Fire. Again, probably not. We might have heard of it. I wouldn't rule that out. I would rule out seeing it as a common battlefield unit. I, I think it's just again, like Kyburn, that they mention this to show their hubris. The author, Martin, pointing out that the Valyrians thought they were above gods at this point and were trying to, you know, influence the midichlorians to make life and th this unholiness, as it were, that, that to show their hubris of we're playing with the stuff of life. And this is nothing I was told in the League. I'm just pointing out quotes from the World Book that other people have devoted more time and energy to of the theories on this. That, and they're contradictory information at times. Just It's intriguing that... Another quote. The Valyrians themselves claimed that dragons sprang forth as the children of the Fourteen Flames. That is the volcano chain around their home. The Valyrians themselves do not claim to have made dragons. That's another point against it. They said... They were nesting in the volcanoes, and they sprang forth from them, that they were the children of the volcanoes nesting there, and we found them. But going on here, just where did the Valyrians come from? The tales the Valyrians told of themselves claimed that they were descended from dragons and were kin to the ones they now controlled. 
we hear over and over again since the first book. The boast, the Targaryens are blood of the dragon. Why, why are there all these incest marriages? Well, we have to keep the bloodline pure. We have to keep the bloodline pure. All these hints that only people of Valyrian lineage, Targaryen lineage, can really bond with dragons, that they're noticeably friendlier to people. Sometimes they're friendly to people who don't have Targaryen blood, but really friendly and willing to bond with. There's all this stuff in the Dance of the Dragons prequel. The TV show tried to present some of that with it. The Drogon instinctively likes Jon Snow because he's Rhaegar's son, that it's in the blood. It's something to do with that, keeping that bloodline pure with all that incest kept, something that lets them bond with dragons easily. And we already knew this, so I'll bring up the elephant in the room. First book, Daenerys' stillborn son, Rhaego. They said he was born covered in dragon-like scales with a stub of a tail and wings like a bat, you know, like the way a dragon does. He looked like a dragon-human hybrid. Horrifically so. And you'll see more of this in, if you're listening to this a little later, the prequel novellas that were collected together and expanded in Fire and Blood, Volume 1, the big new in-universe history book that Martin is putting out November 20th, uh, that we've seen this in the Dance of the Dragons prequel novellas and the Sons of the Dragons prequel novellas about Magor. So if you haven't seen it already, catch up on it in that book and pay attention whenever they talk about all of those incest marriages. The Targaryens had a higher rate of stillbirths and deformities, and not just the Daenerys' stillborn son, Rhaego, that there's a trend of this, that Dance of the Dragons, Rhaenyra had a stillborn daughter who was covered in scales and with a stumpy tail. And then Magor's abominations, his abominations of stillbirths that had small wings like a dragon. And there, you know, it's not just a, yeah, it's probably this. No, no, it's not a either or binary that there's mitigating circumstances of, well, Daenerys got magically cursed by Miri Mazdur, so maybe that wasn't what Rhaegar was going to look like had nothing intervened. Fans have been debating this for 20 years. Why did Rhaegar turn out like that? And as for Magor, we know he was magically poisoned, that one of his rival courtiers, his rival wives, Tiana of the Tower, later admitted, I poisoned the other wives who were pregnant to turn their children into monsters because I wanted to be the only one that gave you children. So in two of these cases, they were magically poisoned, so that might not just be, oh, we randomly had a child born with dragon wings, but it's an issue that comes up, just this mystery of all these references to the Valyrian blood mages trying to make animal hybrids, animal-human hybrids, the Valyrians constantly boasting, we are blood of the dragon, these stillbirths that look like dragon hybrids, and now the Sphinxes, not now the Sphinxes, they were always in the books, the the references to, as I said earlier in this, Maester Amon in his dying rant when he's in and out of delirium, talking about things as important as the Azor Ahai and Prince That Was Promised legends of the dragon must have three heads, he's ranting to Sam, the dragon must have three heads. Next sentence, he's also saying, the Sphinx is the riddle, not the Riddler. That this is an important foreshadowing of things to come, it seems. And that a Sphinx is a bit of this and a bit of that. It's in their name. That, that This was being set up that, well, we're blood of the dragon because we're Sphinxes. You know, chimeras. Or at least that seems to be what they're hinting at. And I think maybe the Sphinxes believe that, but just because they came to convince themselves of that doesn't mean it's necessarily true what legends they have about themselves. I mean, everyone in this world claims that, oh, yeah, my distant ancestor who was the founder of the kingdom uh, took a mermaid to wife, and that's so I'm uh, my an- ancestor was a demigod with, you know, like, during God's grief or the Grey King in the Iron Islands. How much of that is true, we don't know. Moving on from blood magic to 
magic in general, but kind of related to that, just the wider issue, which is central to this whole show of what caused the doom of Illyria, that there were some key hints that were still kind of broad, but bringing the issue up in the world of ice and fire, which I'll share quotes with you here, that world of ice and fire was published in 2014. And the first prequel pitches, they said, were being made in 2016, about two years ago. So I think Martin wanted to bring this up just to get it on paper and didn't realize this might be spoiling a future prequel TV series a bit, because then he didn't think they'd actually have one like this. Or maybe he did, but I don't know how much he tipped his hand with this quote, but I'll give it to you, with just what caused the doom. A handful of maesters, influenced by fragments of the work of Septon Barth, hold that Valyria had used spells to tame the Fourteen Flames for thousands of years, the volcano chain around them, harnessing the, you know, magically harnessing the energy of these volcanoes to fuel their magic, and that their ceaseless hunger for slaves and wealth was as much to sustain these spells as to expand their power and that when at last those spells faltered, the cataclysm became inevitable. That they weren't just taking in thousands of slaves in the mines to get gold and iron, that they were blood sacrifices, that blood magic needs human sacrifice for big things, like powering our control of these volcanoes as you know, magic generators or something, that, that their hunger for slaves was to fuel their human sacrifices in their rituals. The quote goes on, Some, wedding the fanciful notion of Valyrian magic to the reality of the ambitious great houses of Valyria, have argued that it was the constant whirl of conflict and deception amongst the great houses that might have led to the assassinations of too many of the reputed blood mages, who renewed and maintained the rituals that banked and controlled the fires of the Fourteen Flames just suggesting that so many Valyrian mages died in the civil wars that they killed off whoever was controlling this. But who killed who, and maybe someone did it on purpose, I don't know of which faction at this point. I wasn't told anything about the Doom other than just generically oh, this is setting up explaining why the doom happened, which I already said in the initial report, that, guys, you can tell, it's not like they're going to have five seasons, and then as randomly as an earthquake or a lightning bolt strike, oh, and by the way, the doom just happened. Like, something is in motion setting it up. That it's not just going to be some random natural occurrence. And I don't know who or what in what circumstance. At this point, I think any faction could intentionally or unintentionally trigger the doom. I really don't know anything about it. Other than just, it'll explain why it happened means it wasn't just some random disaster. But we shall see. And these are the hints we have already from the books. I'm not saying anything new. That people have been speculating on this since the world book came out. Oh, lastly here, uh, very quickly, just on the subject of magic, even though this isn't about the Sphinxes, the Melisandre TV actress has said since season two in interviews just, oh, she's really 400 years old, as something Martin told her to how she should play scenes, even when she's talking to older people, visibly older men like Maester Cresson, she talks down to them at, like children as if she's older than them, because she actually is, that she's really 400 years old and thinks of them all as younger than her. Now, this set off a lot of alarm bells, as noted by Westeros.org, given that it is the exact date of the Doom of Valyria, that she didn't say oh, she's a thousand, or five hundred, or three hundred, or six hundred. She said four hundred. That's how long ago the Doom of Lyria was. You know, Westeros Org was a little annoyed you know, at her at the time for saying, oh, you, you shouldn't give out secrets like that. But cat's out of the bag, so I might as well address the elephant in the room. That, yes, the actress has been saying that. I don't think... It's not... the 
TV show probably didn't invent, oh yeah, Melisandre's secretly really old. It, you no, know, the books are hinting at that. There's multiple points where she implies she's much older than people think she is. So it's that thing she let slip that Melisandre's really over 400 years old. So the obvious question that now raises, is Melisandre going to be in Empire of Ash? Unfortunately, guys, the simple answer is I didn't think to ask. That just days later, I remembered that. Went, oh, that didn't even occur to me when I was talking. But even if I had, I wouldn't. Even if I had remembered that when we were talking, I wouldn't have asked that because that's something so specific. I wouldn't have pushed my luck. You, you know, you don't ask something that huge. Like, when Martin is talking about uh, the future novels, you don't ask him, hey, is Jon Snow going to sit on the Iron Throne and expect a straight answer? That's crazy. That So, it would have been pushing my luck too much. I probably wouldn't have gotten an answer anyway. That I didn't think to ask, and even if I had, I, I wouldn't have risked it asking about that. So... Even though I didn't ask about it, could we expect this? Well, given that she's alive in that era, and the, these people are fans of of Martin, I personally think they would at least give her a cameo at some point in the show's run, just as a, hey, I'm Melisandre, but not something big. You know, I think, you know, just as, as fans, we could expect her to have a cameo, if nothing else. But the bigger question isn't just, oh, will she pop in for one episode, but will she be a recurring character playing a role of some kind within the narrative? That's what I mean when I say, is she in it, as in part of what's really going on, not just a cameo. I honestly don't know. You know as much as I do. And whatever Martin was trying to set up by telling the actress that, oh, she's really 400, that from what we know of her POV chapters in the books, where she remembers that Melisandre started out as a slave named Melanie, who was eventually sold off to a shy, where she was raised as a red priestess and assumed a leadership role eventually, but you know, as this important emissary, I mean, I don't know who the hierarchy is in terms of leadership, but It'll be fun. I'm in favor of seeing her again, even as just someone's helper. I don't know if she'll be this huge role or a minor role or, if nothing else, a fun little cameo. But that's just talking about magic. That has nothing to do with the Sphinxes. I just squeezed it in here because there was nowhere else to discuss it. So any everything I just said about blood magic, none of that comes from the leak. That is just me as someone who has read the books and is knowledgeable of it, speculating you know, this is stuff we know of Valyria already. In contrast, remember how for they went, hey, we're making The Long Night, and we had nothing to say about it. In contrast, there's a lot more material on Valyria relatively of, wait a minute, what about all the blood mages and the blood of the dragon stuff? This is stuff to discuss. So as I said, this video ran long, so I had to cut up into three parts. And in this part, I just finished talking about differences between the Sphinxes and the Young Dragons in more detail, particularly with their religion. In the next video, I'm going to split off from this one. I'm just going to talk about specifically the Sphinx POV character that was described to me, that just as the platinum blonde haired, black skinned female dragon rider is the POV scale character for the Young Dragons, possibly not their only POV character, but the one that was mentioned prominently. The character I'm going to talk about in the next video is the POV character of that scale for the Sphinxes as a faction.